We've spent the past couple of lessons talking about these single cell memory devices, and they had some pretty standard inputs and outputs. On the input side, we had D, which was our data. We had this little triangle here, which represented a clock input. And that clock input is supposed to identify when we are taking the data D, which I'll label here, and we're gonna store it inside of this box. Now, we also had these two inputs that allowed us to pre-define or, or load, pre-load what we had inside the box. We had one that was called S bar and one that was called R bar. Now, these were active low signals. And so what you did was during the normal operation of this device, you just simply put logic ones there. Anytime you wanted to force or put a one in there. You put a zero on S bar. That zero on S bar set the input to a logic one. If you put a zero just on R bar, that would reset the input, what was, excuse me, that would reset what was in the box to a zero. So these guys typically during normal operation would just be set to a logic one. And then we had two outputs. We had Q and Q bar. Q is the stored value while Q bar is the inverse of Q. And basically the inverse of Q always has to be stored along with Q. I mean, it's gonna be, even if it's not coming out of the box, the inverse of Q is gonna be in the box because it's part of the natural way that we store with logic gates a bit value. Now let's talk about some applications and, and before actually before we do let's talk about the four different ways that this diagram this single cell memory could have been set up. Remember there was the latch and the latch was also and the one that we talked about was the transparent latch. All right and the transparent latch there were two types there was active high and there was active low. Now, these worked pretty much the same way, except with respect to which level it was on the clock that allowed the operation to occur. A transparent latch. Let's talk about active high. Active high said that as long as there's a logic one on the clock, the data is just gonna pass straight through to Q. So whatever changes happen on the data input D are gonna be reflected on Q. Active low said that anytime the clock is a zero, that same instance is going to happen where the data just gets passed straight through Q. When it goes to the inactive state, the opposite state, then whatever the last value that was on D before it went to the inactive state for the clock, that value is going to be latched or held on to Q. Now there were also the edge triggered flip-flops. Now, the way an edge triggered flip-flop works, and we had two types, we had rising edge, and we had falling edge. And these clocked in the data to Q whenever we had a change, whenever we had an edge that was detected on the clock. So there was no transparency here. It wasn't just passing D straight through to Q. It was just capturing or taking a picture of D and storing it into Q at an instant. And so the instant for a rising edge was a zero to one transition. A zero to one transition on the rising edge is gonna capture D and store it to Q. Whereas with the falling edge, you had a one to zero transition, which was gonna do that capturing, all right? So that's a quick review. But now let's talk about some applications. And the first application is actually a pretty simple one. Let me go ahead and make some room on this board before we talk about it. Now what we're gonna make here is gonna be called an event detector. Now the way an event detector works is that, well, it detects an event, right? Let's say that you're waiting for somebody to, I don't know, call, but you can't actually hear the ring. Instead, there's just a light. Maybe you've got your phone on silence and, and, and there's just a light. Maybe, the, maybe there's a, just something on the display that lights up whenever, the, whenever a call comes in. If you don't wanna miss the call, what you're gonna be doing is continually looking at the phone to check for the light, right? You wanna continually look at the phone to check for the light because if the call stops, stops, 
then the light's going to go away and you will have missed it. Computers work in a very similar way whenever it comes to polling our input. This idea of polling input means that I keep checking to see if there's a change on the input. And so maybe there's just a single bit, and maybe it's connected to a button. And whenever the user pushes the button, it goes from a logic one to a logic zero, and then when they release the button, it becomes a logic one again, all right? And if you wanted to detect somebody pressing the button, you'd have to keep checking that I.O. input and checking it and checking it and checking it. Now, the processor's busy doing other things too. And so what happens if the processor's busy doing some other process, the user presses the button, and when they lift their finger off the button, the processor hasn't gotten back yet to detect if that button has been pressed. So what we're looking at is something that may be, and in fact, let's make this active high. I made the button active low, but let's make this active high. All right, so we've got a signal that looks like this. So there's a period of time, we'll call this a pulse width, T sub W. There's a period of time that this event is true, all right? Now, if we happen to be reading maybe too slow and that T sub W happens in between reads, we've missed it. You don't want to miss an event like that. So instead, what we want to do is have this drive a signal that as soon as the event is detected, we go to a logic one and we stay a logic one. All right. That way, if I happen to miss the event, later on whenever I read it, I can see that the event has happened. Now we can use one of these flip-flops to do this. We're going to use an edge-triggered flip-flop in order to do this. In fact, let's go specifically, since I made this a rising edge, what we're going to do is we're going to use a rising edge triggered flip-flop. All right. Now, the way it works is this. I have my system, just like this guy, D, clock, Q. Don't really need to worry about Q bar, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be outputting this guy. This, this signal right here is going to appear on Q. Q bar is just going to be the opposite, so Q bar will just look like that, right? So anyway, what we've got is, uh, and then remember, we also have S bar and we have R bar. All right, so there are all my signals that I want to connect on this latch. Now, what I want to do is I want to take this event and I want to put it as the clock. All right, then what I want to do is I want to attach a logic one. Make a little more room here. I want to put a logic one on D. I want to put a logic one on S. Now our bar, what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this to some sort of a back and forth switch. So I have a logic one and I have a logic zero. Now by default, this switch is going to be on logic one. Remember that if I have a logic one going into S bar and if I have a logic one going into R bar, those ones are going to act as they're, they're, they're idle. They're not going to have, they're not in their active state, so they're not going to set or reset what's inside. And then Q, all right? Now, when this system first sets, starts up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this switch down to the logic zero for just a moment. That moment is going to force a zero onto Q. Then, as soon as I'm done resetting this latch, I'm going to flip it back up, and I've got a zero on logic, or excuse me, a zero on Q. I flip that back up to logic one. I've got a logic one on S bar and R bar, and then, and it's just going to keep that zero here. This logic one on D is going to be held back because I do not have anything that's capturing D or taking a picture of D in this edge triggered flip-flop to store it inside of Q. And so this system right here is just going to keep maintaining a zero until the clock pulses in order to take the logic one and store it in D. So I get a clock pulse. And whenever I get this clock pulse at this instant right here where I have a rising edge, so I remember I've got a rising edge triggered flip-flop here. Whenever I get this rising edge here, it is going to capture this logic one, store it on Q. Now, this guy can go back down. Remember the falling edge has no effect on a rising edge triggered latch or flip-flop. So that falling edge occurs, nothing happens, the one stays on Q. 
And in fact, that one stays on cue until we reset it. So much later, much after this, pa after this pulse has passed, we go ahead and the processor reads it and says, oh, there's a logic one on here. I must have had an event occur. I just missed it. It takes care of it and it acknowledges the fact that this has happened. Now, the way it acknowledges it is it uses one of its outputs to quick put this down to zero. The R bar then resets the output of Q back to zero. And that zero stays there until we get another event. That rising edge will then reset, well, reset. It will then change Q to a one, and, and that one will stay there until the processor gets the chance to read it, all right? So a very simple circuit, just simply putting ones on S bar and D, those are just constant logic ones, putting ones on S bar and D, putting the event we're trying to capture on the clock, and then having some sort of a way to reset this event counter or this event detector. It's all it takes in order to make sure we don't miss this pulse.